when someone is obese, what measures in the body actually encourage them to maintain their state rather than lose the weight? Okay. So, so what are they up against? All right. the, 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 there's been a hypothesis called set point theory. Mm-hmm. And it's the idea that we have like a, a predetermined set point in terms of our body fatness. Mm-hmm. So, and it's kind of linked to the amount of fat cells that you might have and certain hormones that they produce. So what we know is that when we start to lose weight, our body starts to adapt to it. Mm-hmm. And once the more weight that we lose, the more our body starts to adapt. Um, one of the things that underpins that is, is a hormone called leptin. Uh, so, which is a metabolically um, active, if you want to call it that, hormone. Mm-hmm. And it's produced by your fat cells. And that is sensitive to your energy status. So when you lose weight, mm-hmm. you go into a negative energy balance, and you start to expend lots of energy, your body recognises that. And it starts, to, it starts to play around and screw around a little bit with your appetite. Yeah. Okay. So something that people experience, which is associated with their leptin levels, is an increase in appetite and hunger. Um, and a, a reduction in metabolism is one of the things that underpins that uh, adaptive thermogenesis concept that I mentioned a moment ago. So leptin, if we can control it, yeah. if we can mitigate its effects, um, it's potentially one of the things that will allow us to maintain and lose weight for a long period of time. So how would we manipulate our leptin? Um, leptin is probably sensitive to carbohydrate more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be realistic about this and say that if somebody is maintaining weight loss over a long period of time, the periods of, of, that, of that weight loss, they're going to feel quite hungry. Yeah. There, there's, it is a permanent adaptation. But we can reduce the effects of that by looking at your carbohydrate intake. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the things that people have done is to periodically have like higher carbohydrate meals and, and things like that in order to, to reduce the effects of your appetite. Yeah. So do you believe that carb cycling is a good thing within a diet? It can potentially be for some people. For some people, it would be the opposite. Um, For some people, it would be a case of micromanaging their diet and it won't be good. Whereas I think for some people, actually having like a carb cycling approach uh, can sort of help manage the effects of appetite uh, and manage the psychological break as well from always eating certain types of foods and stuff. So yeah, it it can be beneficial, but I think it's going to depend on that person. It's going to be individual specific. So in terms of your protein and fat and carbohydrate intake, what do you think is the ideal macro breakdown? For weight loss or weight maintenance, it's probably a little bit different. I think for weight loss, um, we know that higher protein diets tend to, generally tend to be a little bit more effective. Mm-hmm. Um, effects of satiety, it makes you feel full, you know, potential, even though the reality is probably a little bit less, of increasing something called thermogenesis, dietary induced thermogenesis. So it makes people feel full, it potentially burns energy as a result of eating it, so that, that's a win-win. Mm-hmm. So we know that higher protein diets generally are good for weight loss and weight maintenance. Yep. Um, for weight loss, some people do really well with a low carbohydrate diet, but for other people it actually plays around with their appetite a little bit too much, which isn't a good thing. Um, we know that the effects of a low carbohydrate and a higher carbohydrate diet for weight loss are fairly similar. Um, but a low carbohydrate diet for some people will be much better than a high carbohydrate diet because some people might just feel hungrier as a result of eating the carbohydrates. Okay. For weight maintenance, uh, the research is suggesting that a very low glycemic index diet, higher in fiber, with a moderate to high amount of protein, mm-hmm. was probably one of the best ways that we can manage uh, weight over a long term. And do you think fat or sugar is more the enemy to obesity? I think. I think looking at foods as an enemy is potentially a problem. Yeah. Uh, can be, um, because it can take, create that concept of rigid restraint. Yeah. I think sugar um, is problematic because it can affect your appetite. You know, you eat something that's sugary, you might make you want to eat something else that's sugary, and it starts to, it starts to, to affect the reward processing systems in the brain, uh, which can be a problematic. Um, I think if we just say to people, you can't ever eat sugar, mm-hmm. um, it's going to create that rigid restraint. It's not yeah. going to be a good thing. It's going to create all or nothing thinking. It's going to create that dichotomous thinking where you think, okay, if, I've got, if I'm not supposed to eat sugar and I have a little bit, well, I'll just I'll ruin my diet today, so I'm going to go eat loads. And I find that people, what they focus on is actually what they want. So if you focus on not eating sugar or cake, that's all you end up wanting to eat, mm. as opposed to I'm going to eat more balanced with protein and fats um, and carbohydrates, say from oats or fruit or vegetables. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's true. Um, and I think that comes down to maybe restructuring what people view as being food and what's being something that they want to eat. You know, our taste preferences are malleable, they can change. Mm-hmm. So you know, if, you, if, you, if you're constantly eating certain types of foods that are very salty, very fatty, that, you know, you've, you've become accustomed to a certain type of taste. 
Yeah. Once you change that taste, you, you, you're effectively changing your eating experience. So you need to, in some cases, um, look at ways of number one, making food more palatable for you, but number two, maybe chase, changing your taste preferences at the same time. And that takes time, doesn't it? It takes um, days and weeks of eating fresh, like high quality, good ingredient food, as opposed to the really processed, high sugary, high tasty, but low in nutrient food. Yeah, exactly right. And what foods, as a doctor and specialist, would you avoid completely? I would avoid trigger foods. So I would, I would, I would have people identify what foods that they want to eat, what foods that they enjoy eating, and maybe what foods can be problematic for them. Mm -hmm. If a food is going to be a trigger, i.e. you're going to eat it and it's going to lead to binge eating, yeah. that can be a problem. And I think avoiding a food like that would be an issue. Um, what tends to do that for a lot of people, it tends to be, you know, we've mentioned sugary foods. Um, for some people, you know, the, the presence of, of, of a certain amount of sugar and a certain amount of fat in the mouth at the same time creates a sort of pleasure response that makes you want to eat more and more and more of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, 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 I think it would be an individual specific thing and I'd have people avoid foods that they're aware mm -hmm. could be a problem for them. Like if you eat one biscuit and then you have to eat the entire pack, don't have biscuits in yeah, your house. Don't have biscuits in your house. <laughs> that won't happen. <laughs>